Uh, for people who have been at Elry for any time, Brian doesn't actually need any introduction. Um, but there are a number of new people, so it would be good probably to say a few things about Brian. Brian's been at, at ILRAD and ILRI for 20 years. And uh, he's been a very influential force in the evolution of ILRAD and then ILRI over the years. And let me just highlight three or four things that, that Brian's contributed to. He was very important in the movement of ILRI from just being behind its four walls in the lab to actually getting out into the field. So the kind of introduction of ILRAD to the developing world. Um, and, and in introducing epidemiology and socioeconomics to that. He's also been very influential in the whole kind of international thinking about the role of animal diseases and poverty alleviation and, and has written a number of influential things on, on that. He's uh, influenced the new ILRI strategy. He was on the task force that did that. And he's been very influential in some of our new thinking about markets and SPS and how we move on that. So you can see that Brian's made a tremendous contribution over the years to ILRI. And it, and it, and it seemed very important to have some kind of a milestone to this fitting event that Brian will be retiring from the kind of full-time service to ILRI. He won't be ending his relationship with ILRI, but this full-time service at the end of March. And uh, as a kind of milestone for that, and because of Brian's kind of long contributions, as I've said, but his real passion for ILRI, we wanted to capture some of his parting words. So this is the kind of parting words of, of ILRI to ILRI from Brian. So Brian, please. Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an amazing uh, pleasure to be uh, asked to, uh, to, to give you some rambling thoughts of, uh, of mine. And John, thank you very much indeed for that kind of introduction uh, uh, for that. Let me uh, get straight on. Many people have been uh, entertained by, uh, by, by this title, uh, which is basically, uh, as I say with apologies here, uh, to uh, Lewis Carroll um, for, from Alice Through the Looking Glass. He said, uh, time has come, the world was said, to talk of many things. Uh, in, a, in the original it said of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings, of why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings. Now, I've taken a few liberty of, of bringing, uh, bringing livestock, uh, uh, but bringing chameleons and leopards, uh, the, the concept of changing colour, uh, but not necessarily changing one's, uh, one's uh, inherited characteristics. <laughs> and, uh, so I thought it might be, it might be very, very useful as a, as a, as a title. Uh, and the pigs have wings, well, I mean, the question is, will we reduce poverty uh, meaningfully before pigs start to fly? <laughs> okay. Why the seminar? Well, John has partly explained it. Uh, um, uh, basically, I've been put out to pasture. <laughs> Certain age, one is incompatible with the, with the early <laughs> uh, Two elements of this, of this seminar. Uh, number one, uh, I'm going to try and, and make a few comments on the positioning of Ilry as a global convener of change in the field of poverty reduction through livestock. Uh, and in that part, uh, I, I actually had written something about two weeks ago, and I basically abandoned it. Um, yesterday, because I wanted, I felt it would be more appropriate to draw on many of the things that have been said during these uh, the, these few days. And secondly, uh, a slightly more light-hearted uh, view of the dynamics of Ulri uh, and her staff uh, over some 20 years. Uh, some personal reflection. Let me start on the more on the more serious side. Uh, uh, the key challenges in, in Ilri's task of, uh, of bringing together livestock uh, and poverty reduction. And we're faced with these huge weaknesses uh, in developing country capacity uh, that don't allow the optimal exploitation of their, of their amazing livestock resources. And these are human, uh, financial, and uh, organizational, and of course technical, as, as we all know. But the other major challenge, I think, is this increasingly, divide, increasingly divided imperatives uh, of the developed and developed, developing world. And they are, uh, we've we brought many of them up during this meeting, the climate change, uh, the uh, disease control, the spread, which is going off and through the West, and of course all these international standards that are getting more and more difficult. 
What are some of the key opportunities? Well, I put three, uh, and I think these are central to our life. Uh, the multiple benefits of greater and higher quality market access uh, at, at all levels, and I think these are uh, these are amazing. This is secondly, and, and you may think I'm overstating this, but I believe the steadily increasing capacity to secure livelihood uh, assets and reduce vulnerability. I really believe, and we've heard many things to, uh, this, uh, these few days that indicate that we're we're getting better at that. We're recognising uh, the importance of vulnerability and analysing it. That. And of course, thirdly, the recognised advantage uh, of, of natural resource conservation. So, the question we all ask is often, uh, is can a small player, uh, very much research orientated, uh, somewhat, uh, depending on your view, uh, underskilled, uh, unskilled in development issues, uh, and somewhat of an ivory tower, uh, how can we play uh, an unoptimal role? Not easy. Uh, I suggest I put here some of my favourites, uh, uh, but drawn on, on your favourites, to adding value to other research and development initiatives through fostering greater understanding of the links between the livestock uh, and poverty reduction. This targeting role, I really feel that that's a major opportunity and should be strengthened within IRI in the future. The targeting role, the gathering of empirical evidence uh, of the poverty reducing policies and strategies uh, that we are involved in. The third point I put here is very important, and I'm going to come back to that in, in different aspects, is that it, the importance of products, a business plan, the choice of regions and partners, and this issue of opportunism versus idealism. We are, we are more and more an idealistic institute but we should also be thinking of these products and how we can take uh, opportune uh, moments. If I, animal health has been, as John said, one of, one of my focuses, and I just draw one slide here to say what I think are the important opportunities in animal health, for pro poor animal health, uh, four areas. Uh, this issue of protecting the very vulnerable and the role of, the role of safety nets, we haven't really, uh, this gets well away from traditional veterinary services in many, in many circumstances. You see, the issue of promoting market access at various levels, well, it, we, we, we of course deal with that. Improving productivity, which is, um, you might say, old hat, and of course improving human health. But the key point here is that these will require a new range of animal health expertise to meet the demands uh, uh, to, uh, and to complement traditional uh, veterinary skills and the sorts of, sorts of things uh, that Jeff Mariner uh, and, and Chris <coughs> to this in terms of participatory techniques is one example of that. Now looking at, at, at how we have managed this within the CG uh, Livestock Institute, we had Ilka's uh, farming research with tangible international products and we then moved to Bilrat and the search for vaccine technologies for East Coast fever and trypanosomiasis, trypanosomiasis, two diseases, but nevertheless again produce these tangible products, particularly uh, on understanding of the bovine immune system, that were very important. Now the new, our new role, since then leaping straight into the world, is this, the emphasis more on policy, the focus on global public goods, this new geographical dispersion that is being uh, that we're being pressurized into quite rightly uh, the devolution of our activities to national and regional partners and of course the nice uh, external program and management review endorsement of this visionary and dynamic institute that we now have the, the I, call this the sexy lady. I mean, we are, we look uh, like the sexy lady, and I'll just talk about that in a second. Uh, but, but the question is, are we, are we really uh, a new species, or are we simply uh, a, the response of the chameleon? Are we changing colours and adapting? Humans uh, really take an awful long time to, uh, to, to evolve. Uh, and I suggest that we're, we're possibly very much in the, in, in the chameleon stage. Now, uh, imagine, the sec back to the sexy lady, we've got the stage set, we've, got, uh, we're, we've gone to a concert, uh, we're waiting uh, for the singer to come on, and there it is, this is us. I'm afraid I haven't got uh, beautiful singers, but I've got a beautiful uh, lady polo there. Um, <laughs> 
that she comes on and she's about to uh, open her mouth and, and this is every we all think it's great but the question is sexy good looking bright and alert but can the lady sing? <laughs> and that's the key question that many people are going to be asking. So in other words, beauty and art are in the eye of the eyes of the beholders. Um, and as I see here, EPMR teams come and go, uh, but the rest of our major stakeholders are here for a long time, and they may and they have. Uh, rather more synthesized, possibly, views uh, as, to, as to where we are and where we're going. And, and some of these important ones uh, are the Science Council, the need, for the, uh, the need for the science and the outputs, the CG as a whole, and the need to think about, about funding the donors, one with this agenda, one with that agenda, our national and regional partners who maybe have other agendas, and of course the international agencies uh, such as FAO, and they all have different views and they don't necessarily uh, all see us as the sexy lady. And I'll come back to FAO in a moment. So how well does our new model respond to these varying demands of, 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 of these and other clients? And I, I'm just thinking of the production system side of that, not our partners. We have a variety of people out there and clients with very different understandings. We've still got some hunter-gatherers uh, uh, around in the, in, the, in the world with their views. We've got the more pastoral systems. We've got the smallholder uh, mixed agricultural systems. We've got the more commercialized uh, dairying, uh, the smallholder dairying in Kenya. And we've got the more intensive all, uh, all, all out there. Now, we have to be able to communicate with those. We have to be able to put our mission over to those. Can we do that? The clear message I'm saying is in this business of these partnerships, that's our business now, communication is paramount, and two particular aspects of communication. So we've got, we now have a, a smart approach. We think we're pretty bloody good, and uh, we've got this, this idea. But le uh, in leadership, we've got to be leading and making sure that others are there. They're with us. They're, we're not sitting, walking out in front and, oh, oh dear, uh, <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're behind. So leadership, so it's understanding of all those other groups that I was talking about is absolutely critical. Uh, awareness of the need to interact with many of the traditional disciplinary based organizations. And they're not just ones that are uh, old fashioned and a national veterinary services or something. Some of the big international organizations also have that uh, uh, characteristic. And so messages explaining our contributions are absolutely essential and particularly as we go out into new horizons and new territories and try to uh, convince people that we're the right people to do business with. And of course, in that, uh, just to remind you that many, there are many politicians involved in the and politicians like simple messages. Um, I have <laughs> got this one uh, with the cryptic, and then. Uh, <laughs> this relationship with our key international partners. Uh, is critical. I'm going to spend a, a little moment on this. And there emerges in a rather fuzzy um, image, FAO. I believe FAO is an absolutely critical partner. And I really believe uh, that we haven't got our act together with FAO, or FAO hasn't got its act together with us. I feel that that is a real challenge. This is a leading uh, implementational uh, organization. We have relations uh, with individuals, uh, but we should be in a much stronger partnership. Uh, so I just use that as an example of one of these where I do feel uh, that there is a misfit. Okay, uh, I am attracted very much uh, to this, uh, the different pillars of pro-poor growth. Now, uh, Carl and I have used this in a recent, a recent paper because I think it's, it, it, it actually nicely fits in to our pathways. I mean, I think there's been some uh, iteration backwards and forwards. So, the four pillars are number one, creating strong incentives for growth. So this is the, uh, the big picture, the right environment, the, uh, the peace, the stability, uh, and incentives for, for, for growth, and, and the role of the private sector. Secondly, this fostering international economic links, uh, access to technology, managerial skills, and markets, so links internationally helping bring things in and exchange ideas in all directions, and the learning process uh, by, by the, developing, the, the developed partners. 
and of course speeding knowledge transfer. The third one is this broad access to assets and markets and that is very central to, uh, to, to Ilri, uh, the aiding distribution of, of the benefits from growth, uh, harnessing countries' labour and initiative. And lastly, the risk and reducing risk and vulnerability. And again, that's central to, uh, to our programme, enabling the poor to, to engage in economic activities that are riskier but, but more profitable. So I, I really like this. Another thing I really like, uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is the six big issues. Now, the other night in the, in, in the bar, in a, in a discussion with, uh, with Bruce, um, we were uh, discussing the geographical dispersion uh, of, of Ilry. Uh, Bruce, what is Bruce here? Yeah. And uh, we, 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 one of the points that, uh, that Bruce made was, look, we did that study uh, a few years ago, we know where the poor are, and, uh, and uh, um, that's where we're going to go. We've got to be constantly revising where we are going and how we go. Okay, we've got to have clear programs and messages, but we need to be thinking how we can mould those, use what we've done and build them and move them forward. I like these six big issues. Uh, first of all, they were raised as, uh, for, as funding opportunities, and they are compelling, uh, in my view, as funding opportunities. Uh, secondly, I really believe uh, uh, that they have lots of appeal as operational areas, particularly as we move into this, uh, this new, wider geographical mandate. And thirdly, they build on our traditional pathways. I'm going to put them up there just to remind you. They build on our pathways. There are some of our pathways in there. But most importantly, and I think this is one of our failings, is that they bring livestock to this broader development agenda. The word livestock doesn't appear in, those, in these big issues, uh, but there are all sorts of other issues in, in, in them. So they are uh, smallholder assets and vulnerability, uh, the market access, we, you, we've, we, we've, you, we've been through these, the production intensification, uh, and, and the first three, of course, are parts of, our, uh, parts of our themes, the special needs of pastoral areas, the impacts of climate change, and the need to respond to emergencies. I've actually changed the avian flu to the need to respond to emergencies, because I think that is where, 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 where we might move. So I think, as I said, these are compelling, and I really feel that they, uh, uh, even from an operational point of view, if anyone in Ilry can contemplate changes in our operational structure. Um, let me put this, uh, th th this little idea for So I, I believe, as an example of this, the need to uh, apply poverty reduction mechanisms context to engaging both the policy and the development actors. Now I'm going to use an example uh, of, of animal health. Uh, so I'm going to say, let's look at our pathways, protecting assets and reducing vulnerability and promoting market access. We already know that some certain diseases we can, we can put in some of these pockets. So Newcastle disease, for example, uh, it is a big thing on protecting assets and reducing vulnerability. Of course, it's also got a little bit of some market access uh, issues. Avian flu is, is a little bit of both. Rabies clearly is, is there. Cysticercosis. Uh, some vulnerability, but a huge thing on marketing. East Coast fever more in the more in the vulnerability of where it occurs. So that is simplistically putting diseases there. However, uh, if we then start to apply this at a regional level and put a production systems context into this, so let's say let's look at the pastoral systems in the Horn and then do our same little uh, pathways on which diseases fit. So we've got Rift Valley fever in the Horn, possibly foot to mouth with all the ex uh, exports. And our mixed crop livestock in southern Africa, Newcastle leaf clearly emerging, tick more diseases, and then on the trade we've got foot and mouth again. Uh, and one could go on and doing this process. However, the next really <coughs> is trying to think of if we're going into if we are thinking of our partners, both in terms of the policy makers and the implementers at both ends of the spectrum. So we're in the business of they are all in the business of protecting uh, protecting assets and reducing vulnerability, and these are our systems. We've, our disease is just one of those constraints. We've got the climate shocks and we've got the water uh, access and we've got the service provision. And so what I'm saying is that both at the, at the sharp end but also at the policy end we need to have a much greater integration with all these different players if we're going to be successful. It's no good the disease people walking in there all on their own and, uh, and, trying, to, uh, and trying to be successful necessarily. Uh, and, and of course also exactly the same in the promoting uh, market access, although some of your columns are going to be different looking at input markets and output markets in those different environments. 
In summary, the need to put our livestock, market, vulnerability, animal health and other issues uh, into a much broader development and natural resource context. Interest in, uh, in the impact of your research on policy. Now this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, research outputs to policy uh, outcomes. Because this is something that we have touched on a little bit this week, but I think is absolutely critical. Uh, and if once you publish that paper, isn't that good enough? I mean, come on, I mean, you have to put it in the, in the MTP, and we've got that as an output. Uh, uh, I think for most people, but not all, it, it, it is rather aspirational, of course. I mean, how? Do you not remember that paper I had? It must have had, you know, so, someone really must have changed their mind as a result of that. It had that great, uh, uh, that, that, that great impact. Well, sometimes yes, and sometimes So, should we not be able to translate this aspiration uh, uh, into more institutional mechanisms to ensure that we have this impact? And so we need to start to be thinking about, well, well, what is needed to do that? Is it just having one person on the project that has to be thinking about what next? And, or, 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 I hope it's a bit more complicated than that, but that's a good start. Uh, whose job is it? What is involved in doing that? And for which types of research is it relevant and which types not? Let's sort of clear, let's tease that out and be much clearer uh, on this. I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, and these are some that I took from a, um, a paper uh, the illusion I uh, gave to the work just a few weeks ago. Uh, one, uh, the pest control. Now, the pest control was in, in Africa was totally top down. It was decided that rinderpest shall be eradicated. Uh, so it was a top down initiative. And JP15 uh, went on for, 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 for several weeks, 1977. Then it re emerged in Mauritania, and the rinderpest control came up, and the case broke up. Then, my question is here, did the participatory approaches that were uh, brought in at the last minute save the day? It was, uh, and this is a lot from, uh, from Jeff Mariner and Chris uh, uh, Van Kleister and other people who were working there, the persistence of infection in the AFAR region and the need to change from this blanket immunization, which was the program there, into much more uh, strategic vaccination focused on the AFAR region where the problem was. And then the int introduction of participatory epidemiology approaches to try and understand uh, what, uh, where disease was and, and then focus in on those. Uh, and, uh, and initially I put from heresy to acceptability because originally in the, in the, in the um, PACE program, uh, um, long before uh, your day of course, <laughs> so, uh, um, uh, it was... Uh, it was thought of as being somewhat heretic, uh, but that has been accepted uh, with still with some controversy. Uh, uh, and then, as a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek, I say at the end, did livestock keepers really want to have rinderpest eradicated? Um, <laughs> another one which I put in a lesson in research to policy failure uh, is the East Coast fever control by infection and treatment. Now you all know about infection treatment, which is the idea that you have these, uh, you, you, you inject these sporozoites in, uh, so you have stable H from infected ticks, storage in straw, simultaneous umbrella with antibiotics, they go in there, you need to monitor. It was developed over 25 years ago, David Radley uh, and others, uh, but not widely used. Um, some possible contributors to the failure, uh, it was very much owned by researchers and all these wonderful researchers uh, who, of course, uh, as they often do, niggle them and say, well, my work is more important than yours, and you have forgotten this and forgotten that. So was it too much influence placed on different strains, etc.? Um, there was very little dialogue with the end users as to what they wanted. They were crying out for something. Uh, there, did the breakup of the East African community uh, affect that and, and, and uh, the Maguga facility? Um, there was no dialogue with the private sector at all. Um, and of course there were also ownership issues with, within some of the institutes involved. Uh, so frankly it was a, a lesson that we should learn from a lot and I'm very happy to say there is this new initiative with, Gal with Galvmed that is trying to uh, uh, address some of these issues. I very much like this policy, uh, uh, research and policy and development rapid analytical framework that has produ been produced by ODI, the Overseas Development Institute in the UK. I think it's really a nice thing for us to think about in our policy, uh, is our research outputs to, to, to policy outcomes. The political context, 
um, all the political and economic structures, the evidence, which is a lot of our role, and of course the links between uh, policy and research communities, and then bearing in mind that there are always these external uh, influences uh, on this. Uh, then when you start to, to, uh, to transfer that into these interfaces, you see that there are certain roles that we could play. So you've got the politics and policy making, the research learning and thinking, uh, and the media advocacy. But the interfaces are all relevant to us. The policy analysis and research, bringing the, uh, bringing the pol politics and the, and the research together. The scientific information exchange uh, and validation. Uh, side. And last but certainly not least is the campaigning and the lobbying. So these are all, uh, I really like this and this is ODI's uh, uh, thinking but I just thought it was useful to share. I'm going to now uh, move to the second part which is more, uh, uh, a little bit lighter, um, which is looking at the, uh, at the dynamics of Uri and her staff uh, over, over 20 years. And as John said, I mean I started my life uh, and these are pictures from those days here in Ethiopia uh, in, in um, some uh, 30 well, well, so years ago. Um, <laughs> uh, involved in this, uh, in, in this Rinderpest control and doing, and doing all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of other things too. And we, and, but my, my days in, in, uh, in the CG system started with, uh, with Ilrad. And here we have uh, the triumvirate that were brought in to restore order to the ailing institute uh, that had been started with the help of Rockefeller Fund. Uh, and, and, and Jack Doyle, Ross Gray and Roger Rowe. Uh, Roger, by the way, uh, always had that smile on his face, even when he was giving you really serious messages. He did. <laughs> um, and a little title that Ross Gray was given was the sheep in wolf's clothing. Normally it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, but, but, but uh, Ross had, his bark was very loud uh, and he would suddenly uh, do all sorts of things, but underneath most people, but not all, uh, believe that he had a heart of gold. Uh, Jack Doyle, um, uh, who was the director of research, and I've written intellectual brilliance uh, in the bunker. Uh, Jack spent a lot of his time, uh, most of his time in the bunker. Uh, you, there was an advantage that in the early evening you could go and catch him in the bar if you wanted to, uh, uh, and, and many people did. Now, in the bunker, am I being critical? So I put here, uh, do the demands of the job uh, make it a bunker-based operation? Um, I'm looking at uh, 2007 here, uh, um, uh, not looking at any particular direction. <laughs> But thinking is, you know, uh, uh, looking at issues of the leopard and its spots, <coughs> in seriousness. Um, Ilri uh, is, uh, I, I started off uh, there and we then moved to there, we then, we then moved to there and then moved to there and now we're finally there. Um, and it started with this little group, the uh, Ilri Socioeconomics Program, started by the, by the Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller Foundation in 1987. Uh, uh, Barbara Grandin, Margaret, our secretary, Adrian McKevy, uh, Pierre Lassard, who came in, as well as he was my PhD the student uh, at the time. And, and that Lab 8, uh, which was the uh, third place, uh, was opened uh, in, uh, by, by Ross Gray and the Swiss who financed that, I might say. And here, we have, uh, here we have Jack and Adrian uh, and others. Um, in those early days, a really important uh, player as far as uh, we were concerned in starting that programme was Bill Thorpe. Bill Thorpe, I actually believe Bill Thorpe is, uh, his contributions to uh, Il Ilka and Ilary are grossly understated and, and, and possibly under-recognised. Uh, he, he, Bill has been exactly the sort of person that the Institute is now seeking in terms of this leadership and partnership and facilitation. Uh, we started this work down uh, at the Kenya coast with Carrie, Ilra, Ilka and Ilra and sort of gave, was the initiation of this work that we did on, uh, on endemic stability having, having uh, to tick-borne diseases in various, uh, in, in various parts. And this picture, nice picture by the way, comes from uh, Stella Masawi who's, uh, who's in the room who's, who's looking at, uh, at East Coast fever risk uh, in, in the region. And young Subash here, when, uh, looking, uh, looking very young, he had a little bit more hair and, uh, and, uh, and not so grey. And Subash, of course, played a very important role uh, in, in the tick-borne tick diseases. And I was here pulling his leg at the fact he was trying to compete with me in growing a beard. <laughs> um, then we had the other players, and again some of these lovely cartoons from, uh, uh, from Declan McKeever. Dear Alan Young, who was 
the last uh, real authority on the dynam dynamics of telluria power. Uh, John Young, uh, who, who really looked like that, or looks like that, <laughs> Beautifully captured, and John was the complete science whiz kid, buried in the in, in the labs at all times of the day and night. Um, uh, Declan also did this lovely picture of Peter Doherty, uh, who of course was the chairman of our program committee uh, uh, on Irad, and he even had the cheek to do one of me. <laughs> Uh, interestingly, the last moving from uh, the last external review of Hillary, the, the EPMR, there uh, was there was a certain gentleman who's sitting in the second row there, uh, 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 who was on that, uh, who sort of said, "Epidemiology, uh, right? What we really need is some quick and dirty economics. We don't need to know the science behind what's going on. We need to." Uh, that's why I put EPMR team members which is a subtle way of, of, of describing um, uh, that, that it was Carlos on there. Um, but, uh, so he said, for goodness sake, get rid of epidemiology. And actually, he was absolutely right at that time. Uh, I, I believe that he was right. Uh, luckily, um, Ilrat didn't t take any notice of it. <laughs> <laughs> or life might have been quite different. Um, but at that time, we had one economist. And here we were trying to put diseases in context. The merger with, uh, with, uh, with Ilka, of course, gave us far too many economists. <laughs> We've been struggling with that ever since. <laughs> so then what happened? Uh, uh, Ilri was born. So first of all, looking like this, which is, I've always described as the, uh, as the gibbon in the cage. Um, and then we moved on to that one. Uh, and then, guess what? We had the arrival of Ilka Man to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to look after us, so coming directly from one, uh, one institute to the other. Uh, and what fun that was. Uh, um, ironically, H Hank and I are, are working together on a project. <laughs> Uh, our, from our point of view, we then became uh, the, the Systems Analysis and Impact Assessment Group, which was actually the start of the Theme 1 in those days, uh, which has luckily gone a long way, uh, much further from what we were. So we're looking at production systems focus, strategic research, you know, whether the institute, which systems, which species. So we started to think in, in these terms and then looking at strategies and policies for delivery, uh, 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 adoption and in, in impact. However, um, uh, the I mean, heavy duty politics at that, that, that time uh, in this transition. And so that little systems analysis and impact assessment group which I led was then divided into three. Uh, and I might say uh, that the three, which started off very small, uh, all three grew in, 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 uh, in, in size and in capacity and in product, which is, which is rather nice. So we had systems analysis, which Phil Thornton uh, then uh, moved into taking over. We had livestock in the environment, and Robin in the back there uh, took over that, and epidemiology disease control, uh, which, which I did. And then we came into this era of the epidemiology and disease control, and you recognize a few uh, familiar faces. Uh, familiar faces here. Andrew Derry who's, who's gone, Henry Chiara, uh, and of course um, uh, uh, this young man, John <laughs> uh, and Tom. And I'm going to come back to them in a second. <laughs> um, then the changing of the guard, and, uh, uh, and, and in, came, in came Carlos, and uh, introducing uh, new uh, personalities, uh, new, I new ideas, and, and I, I, I would, uh, I've written notes here to make sure I don't sort of uh, mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, I, uh, Carlos and I, I think, have had a very functional relationship. Uh, 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 I have, I always described it, and uh, to, to many present in the room and, and externally, uh, described Carlos as a breath of fresh air. Um, and, I, and, and I still maintain that. Um, I, as you think, I think you know, I'm not the psychophantic type. Um, uh, so, and, 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 and I've always had the highest respect for him. We're both, we're both I think, de dedicated people. Uh, we're both um, uh, possibly emotional people uh, and, and um, committed people. So then, uh, th but this is now, this is a very uh, personal thing. At that sort of stage came this, uh, and, and also in the, uh, in the re previous merger, this sort of issue of science versus management uh, and destiny and evolving forces. I actually clearly, I mean, I was a young scientist, I was doing uh, uh, reasonably quite well. In the era of, uh, of Ilrad, uh, I was the equivalent of one of, the, one of the three or four directors, and I had that role for whatever it was, five, six, seven years, and it, and it went very well. Then, uh, uh, 
then in came uh, Hank. Um, uh, and then, uh, clearly, uh, what I describe here is the rise of the psychophants uh, and the marginalization of the conscientious objectors. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I was... Uh, I don't know whether that captures it for any of us. Uh, um, but, uh, but I was one of the conscientious objectors, and so uh, yeah, um, Hani Selassie also, also used to do this, as other, uh, as other political leaders is. You know, you get, Hani Selassie used to post people to the Afar or somewhere like this. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, and then, but then we've now moved into the new Ilri uh, and the era of political correctness. I, I, I characterize it on uh, um. Now, Carlos. Uh, is, uh, so here I had already suffered uh, at, the, at the hands of Hank because I was too outspoken in one of the conscientious objectors. Carlos, you could always tell what, the, whether Carlos is thinking positively or his expression uh, gives it away immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 so I, put, I, I pulled this photograph out and captured it there because the problem that I had is in a, in a PC environment, uh, leadership and outspoken polo players that uh, just do not go together. And I'm afraid that, uh, that was me. So, um, but however, the saving grace was uh, that, that, that uh, and I put this down here, uh, I, I believe Donald O'Hare, and I don't know this, but Donald O'Hare, who, who I've always respected, and I think, and I very much admire the way Carlos has brought him in from the outside regularly to look at Hillary Management. I believe that, Carl, uh, that Donald O'Hare said, OK, well, look, Perry's going to be a bloody liability in many cases, but for goodness sake, he might be able to contribute something. Uh, so, you know, how are you going to cope with that? So, there was a brief appearance of this livestock resources group, and I put group because, uh, because you see the group standing right there. <laughs> Um, so, uh, anyway, it didn't, it didn't last too long, and then uh, in the, the market steam... <laughs> Chris Delgado came in, and, 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 I, and, uh, and Chris very kindly asked me to be, to be part of that group. So my, my retrospective synthesis of this is we had uh, an era of basic research, which was sound science products, but, but un totally unsustainable within the changing CGI environment. We then had a botched integration period uh, with a loss of confidence, um, but many opportunities for entrepreneurial pockets to thrive, and I believe that that's when uh, John, Tom, and I, for example, and Robin and uh, and, and um, Phil Thornton and others, and others, and the, and the small hot dairy that were able to do that. And we now have this new paradigm uh, of poverty uh, reduction pathways. Uh, the stunning blonde that I mentioned before uh, of the CG brings renewal of confidence. Let me some some low spots of the last. 20 years, uh, uh, and I've got here uh, the dreaded APM, uh, the cocktail of endless diatribes from the front uh, and serious hangovers. Now, if you look at this picture, uh, look at Asagi. I mean, he is asleep. <laughs> he is totally asleep. Uh, uh, and then you look at that little chap stuck in the back there, uh, John, who's sort of um, uh, thinking, where else could I be? <laughs> But most important, I want to emphasise, is, is some high spots. Now, my wife said, please remember, they're personal high spots, because many, for many people in the audience, uh, they won't be high spots for them. <laughs> uh, first of all, the people of Ilry, and that is seriously and genuinely uh, a major high spot, because over these 20 years, um, I have come across some amazing people, uh, and, and that's captured in this, uh, in this picture. Um, some more individual ones. Uh, there, are, there have been two major occasions in which I believe that the sum of the part, the, the product has been infinitely greater than the sum of the parts. This was one, and this was this partnership between myself, uh, Alan Young, and, and Andy Norville on the epidemiology of telluriosis. And it was, uh, it, it was just an amazing process, and we all had so much fun, and I think got uh, produced so much more. The second one I've got here is the, uh, which is, I'm not now talking about the greater than the sum of the parts, I'll come back to my second one in a minute. Uh, the, 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 the second one was the ISVI, ISVI 94, we organised this international um, society 
Society for Veterinary Epidemiology and Economics. The Kenyans amongst you will remember, or will recognize uh, uh, Simeon Niachai here, who is still uh, actively engaged in politics. He was then Minister of Agriculture. And, uh, and dear Lucy Kirori, who was, uh, who was my secretary at that time and, and, and is still uh, working hard as, a, as administrative support. Uh, a high spot was our nomination of the, the, the USAID funded project in Southern Africa on on, uh, on, Southern Af on heart water with all these different institutes and we were nominated uh, for Italy but we didn't get it in the CG. Now this is the other greater than the sum of the parts which was a combination over several years between uh, John, uh, Tom uh, uh, and myself and there were many products uh, and, and it was a great partnership in which we were uh, all had brought different things to the table and, and, and hence and this was one of those uh, this was one of those now John I've known for a long time John came originally to, uh, to CEDA uh, supported project at the university uh, and came over and asked if, if I would help be, uh, be an external reviewer and we linked in with various uh, masters and other students uh, and, uh, and I've always had uh, a, a very nice constructive, uh, uh, collaborative, productive relationship uh, with John but John sort of went, uh, then he went upwards he went <laughs> Okay, Thomas. <laughs> then, you got, uh, then, you got, then you got Tom. And again, Tom, I, I, I always admired and respected Tom. Tom came in from Rice. Uh, and he came in knowing nothing about livestock. Uh, he brought uh, his first task when he arrived. I said, I've got to give this paper on the, uh, the economics of, of, uh, of disease control uh, uh, generally. Uh, would you like to be part of that? Tom then buried himself for two months in all the economics papers and, 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 and did an absolute fantastic job. Uh, at the end of our group, uh, Tom, I don't know, Tom sort of, um, he's, I think he then went, he's a little, little bit like Ian Smith. Ian Smith, uh, as you know, uh, de de declared this unilateral de declaration of independence, UDI. <laughs> you, know, you remember the days of never, ne not in a thousand years are we going to have a black government in Rhodesia. Uh, uh, now I don't know whether Tom translated it and never in a thousand years am I going to join the free uh, 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 but I'm happy to say that I understand that he might be, uh, be, be becoming more involved in theme 3 and maybe the last laugh will be in him because uh, theme 2 has disappeared so he probably even if he joins the markets theme it'll probably be theme 2 so, <laughs> <laughs> so he went this way I mean, uh, Other ones that we had would be the, 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 the partnership with FAO on the, uh, on the SPS issues, which was very nice. It was nice to, uh, to get this Outstanding Scientist Award. And, and uh, you'll notice here, it was also rather fun to, to say hello to Robert McNamara. Um, uh, apart from his p political background and his intellectual strength, it was also quite nice, because I don't know, he was sort of in his 80s, and I think he'd just married a 30-year-old or something like this. So, <laughs> so quite impressive. Uh, Susan Macmillan I put up here uh, Susan has been so supportive but as have many and I don't like to in introduce uh, individuals into this but Susan has always been thinking about the, uh, the communications role and as I said uh, that is one of my uh, points that I think is very important uh, my colleagues in Central America uh, Edwin and Federico here and, and, and all uh, their products uh, that are emerging from that region our recent glo glo global roadmap. Uh, from India, uh, which is now going to turn into this report, which will be launched, launched in FAO in, on the 17th of April. And then this continuing, the sort of, this is my last thing from Hillary, in the, the bigger one, looking at this poverty reduction in animal health. Now, uh, just a la the, the last moment, this is my, my father on the left-hand side, uh, who, um, who I always respected a great deal. This is, this is rather fun, this lovely old car, and this was at a hunt. Uh, somewhere in Norfolk, uh, he said to me, um, uh, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Uh, so uh, I've tended to, as you probably know, I mean this was taken in 1974 at the last uh, race meeting uh, at Jan, what used to be Jan Hoy Meadow, and this is me crossing the finishing line. Now whether all the other horses were here, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> This is, this is Dan Wimbledon, and this is when um, uh, my wife and I went back two years ago to have a look, and you can see it. But amazingly, the steward's box is still there. Uh, whether it's a national heritage monument, I don't know. Uh, 
Uh, I got heavily involved in many years in, uh, in uh, show jumping and eventing, and more recently in polo. In fact, uh, even we won this uh, eight gold tournament in the Kenya Open last year, and you add all the other ages up, and you still don't come anywhere, do you? <laughs> um, uh, but there are problems, as you probably know. <laughs> So occasionally interferes with other, uh, these are polo balls, uh, and occasionally even problems in the... Uh, <laughs> the I, I want to finish uh, on the note to say uh, thank you very much. I have got, uh, you, you've seen pictures of my wife, I'm lucky enough to have two, uh, two delightful daughters who I will be able to, uh, to possibly spend more time with uh, in, in the future and I very much look forward to that. I'd like to thank you all for your support uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, the lights are still on in the evening. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you very much.